Hey, ladies. We have a very special guest today, and we're going to talk about a topic that we really haven't covered very much on the show. We're going to talk about love, but we're going to talk about love in a unique way, and we're going to talk about loving yourself. And while we talk about love, the key to self-love is quieting your inner critic. And this is very hard for me to say for some reason, but we're going to start with as entrepreneurs, how can we quiet that inner critic? critic so that we can love ourselves so that we can then in turn love others more, better, all the way around, make things better. I guess our relationships will become better and we'll be more confident throughout our entrepreneurial journey and the decisions that we make. I want to stress when you guys all know that I am a woman of faith and that is very important to me. And so I'm very conscientious or cautious of who I bring on the show, as I want to make sure that our conversations are aligned and they feel good for everybody. And this love is one of those topics that I think sometimes people associate with, oh, that's so woo woo. And oh, we're not supposed to love ourselves. But I want to remind everybody that in Mark, I think 32, 34, Jesus said that, of course, the first commandment is to love him above everyone else, but then to love your neighbor as yourself. So the Bible tells us specifically that we are to love ourselves. Paul writes about it again in Romans. So I want you to come into this conversation with a very open mind, an open mind to accept the advice, the discussion in a way that you can quiet your inner critic, accept yourself as you are. We're going to give you four steps that you can start to use to initiate that and then maybe even work with the person that we're having on today as a very special guest and that is Erin Willis and Erin is a naturopathic doctor and she is a self-love expert and so that's what we're diving in today and I'm so glad you're all here so without any further ado I'm going to bring Erin Willis on to the Robin Grape show welcome Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to have this conversation and to be a part of your community for today. Thank you so much for having me. Yep. Welcome. Happy to have you here. And I'm happy to dive into this conversation. The listeners know that I published my book, You, Me, and Anxiety, and it's basically my memoir. And I lived with so much anxiety and for so many years. And along with that comes shame. And along with that comes a lack of self-confidence. It, for me, I would, had an eating disorder. I did not like myself. And I criticized myself to the 10th degree every day of my life for many years. And it wasn't until I really dove into a lot of mindset work and I started doing more faith study and really grew myself as a person to understand more about who I am and self-acceptance and to love myself as I am instead of trying to please other people all the time. It changed my life dramatically. And having written the book was really that almost like a cleansing moment of vulnerability where I got everything out. And now I truly am me instead of living under a facade. And so for me, this, this conversation is so incredibly important because I want people to accept themselves and love themselves so they don't have to have a life journey, whether it's in their personal journey or their entrepreneurial journey that is feeling just icky every single day. So with all that said, I could talk uh -huh. about this forever, but tell everyone a little bit about you. You live in the beautiful Portland area, Oregon area, I should say, which is such a gorgeous state, but tell everybody a little bit more about you and your journey to get to where you are today, doing the work you're doing. I will gladly. I just want to comment on what you said earlier, that first, this idea of so often we think of being spiritual or of being a good child of God as like being in service and giving. And so what happens often, like you just said, the commandment is to love our neighbor as ourselves, not more than ourselves, not instead of ourselves. So I think that's just really important. And I have definitely found, and I hope we can, I can get you guys on board today that the more we love ourselves, the more we can be in service of others. Because how much does the inner critic stop us from doing just that? Yeah, like Robin said, I'm a naturopathic physician and I live in the Pacific Northwest in a little town in Oregon on the Columbia River Gorge. So beautiful. I'm looking at the Columbia River right now. It makes me so happy. 
And this, my self-love journey and my medical kind of career have fused at this point, but started separately. And so I'll start with the self-love part. Like in 2009, I went to this festival with a friend and we were looking at all the activities that were happening and there was a self-marriage ceremony. And when we first saw this idea of like self-marriage, we were confused and, but also intrigued, like we got to check this out. So we went to this little self-marriage meeting to see what it was all about. And it was a small crew of 25 women and this beautiful lady led us through this ceremony where essentially what we did was identify um, what it was that we were seeking in a partner. Was somebody to make me laugh, somebody to make me feel confident when I feel dumb, or somebody to support me, someone to make me feel beautiful. And then the rest of our experience together was identifying that we could provide that very same thing for ourselves, And then a commitment to doing that for the rest of our lives. And that for me was such a huge turning point because at that point I was totally like looking for the guy that would make me confident, that would make me feel smart, that would make me feel pretty, that would, that I could then go out into the world and be my full self. And I was just like, holy cow, I can do this. Of course, I can be my own confidence booster. I can give this love to myself. And that was really just a turning point for me in my life. And I've held on to that concept and that idea throughout my career. Like I just keep coming back to it. And so then I went to medical school and naturopathic physicians. For those of you guys that don't know, it's a primary care profession. So we're trained to be primary care physicians. And so I came out of school trained to be in primary care. And towards the very end, I learned about mind-body medicine, which is really just find the mental emotional roots that are associated with physical complaints, which y'all all know, like when your stress gets worse, like your acne gets worse, or your hair will start falling out, or you gain weight. And so like really identifying the connection between these two and helping the people to heal mentally, emotionally, and have physical relief of their symptoms. And I was just blown away by that practice. And so I did that for a while in private practice in Portland, like using this, doing mind body healing with people. And it was really beautiful. It was just the beautiful, deep work. I just love that, that, like helping women primarily were my clients to understand. It's like always comes down in the end to how I am whole and complete as I am. Somewhere along the way, we figure out that we're broken or something's wrong with us. And so when I, this work came together, when I, when COVID happened, I had just moved and I, I was moved to another town and COVID happened. I didn't really want to open a practice here. And then once it was like, okay, you can't even go outside. I was like, I'm going to give this online thing a whirl, <laughs> being a, doing business online. And I didn't want to practice medicine online. So I turned to this self-love coaching. Like how can I combine my knowledge in mind, body medicine? And I had since 2009 been teaching classes on self-love and really developing like skills and practices for people that like don't even really, it's a hard concept to understand. So that's like in a nutshell, kind of how I came to be the self-love doctor now. That's what I call myself. And I teach skills and practices of, of self-love so that women can yeah, just feel more powerful and authentic and confident in their lives. I love it because I think that we so often experience things in our life. Maybe they're traumas, maybe they're failed relationships, maybe they're mistakes we made that we just hold on to. And that lends to so much criticism moving forward instead of acceptance. And we know that our thoughts create our results, like our thoughts in impact, our feelings and our beliefs, which then influence our actions or inaction and our behaviors. And so every person who isn't doing that mindset work or working on their mind, trying to better their mind and their understanding of themselves is causing delays in either life or business success, as well as that ability to discover true joy and hope and peace and purpose. And so I really like this and I, I think it's going to be a, such a great conversation. So let's dive into what you see most often with entrepreneurs or your patients that are 
or I guess clients now, but where that inner critic really comes into play. And obviously if you make a mistake, you can criticize yourself. Your inner critic can be screaming at you, but it goes so much more, I think, beyond and deeper than that. It is. It's a, the inner critic. I really love working with the inner critic because a hundred percent of people have, I've asked the most confident, the most evolved, whatever people, spiritual people, the most successful people, hundred percent. So like that just gives me so much peace to know that hundred percent of people experience the inner critic. And I teach the first practice of self-love as self-kindness. And the biggest obstacle to self-kindness is this inner critic. So it's a really good entryway, something that we can all really like work with. And yeah, it comes up in all sorts of different ways. And I'm an entrepreneur also. So of course I like experienced this. You said earlier, I was a self-love expert and maybe I know a lot about self-love and I've developed some systems that really help me and my clients understand it. But I'm just, I'm a huge self-love nerd and student. It's like forever practice. I don't think it's yeah. how you ever become expert at it. But the most common areas in entrepreneurship and all y'all listening, just think about when, if any of these resonate for you or what, where you experienced inner critic is in these perceived failures, you know, like failed launches, flopped reel, fear of going live or showing your face or in comparison with other people on your journey that have so many more followers or so many more sales, or they seem to comparisonitis. These are really the most common places, whatever corner you put yourself into, where then you perceive yourself as a failure and the inner critic can stop you right in your tracks. Mm, that's so true. And as you were talking, a thought came to my mind and it's not even necessarily something that you would consider a failure, but those questions of why them, not me. And I think that question drags a lot of people down because I've heard, well, so has so many clients or so has all these followers and I'm not getting that. And so when you look at when your inner critic is saying you're not good enough because so-and-so is doing it better, there's, there are reasons for that. So instead of criticizing yourself, let's dive into what you could do to change that scenario versus putting yourself down. Because again, if you're sitting there thinking they're so much better at this than me, then you're going to not feel great and you're not going to take action. That's going to transform whatever that is that you're desiring mm -hmm. to achieve. Yeah. So there's a couple different pieces there. I think of it like, like in this comparison, I just situation, right? Like why them, not me. So you can look at it to like the practical pieces. Oh, that person is posting consistently. And I'm just like in an anxiety tunnel over here. Mm -hmm. That person has been at it for 10 years and I'm yeah. just two years in. So you can think about the rational part, but the inner critic is, ir is irrational. Very. You know, it doesn't yeah. really care about all the actual real world, world reasons why this is true. And so this is, yeah, it's the inner critic. Ultimately, spoiler alert, is a piece of you that needs your love and attention. So I think now would be a good time to just dive right in into these four steps. And yeah, I would to love to. Okay, mm -hmm. cool. I would love to. And yeah. And just so you guys know, I teach this in like a full workshop. You'll have access to the full workshop in the show notes or something like that, but I'll just walk you through the four steps so you can start to think about it now in terms of your entrepreneurial journey. And just, it's not, none of it is that complicated. So even just listening to this show, I think that you can pick up this process that will help you pick yourself up and keep moving. Ultimately, that's the ticket. That's what we want. We want you to keep moving forward in your process and your journey, building your business, taking care of your family, whatever it is. The first step is getting to know them. Okay. And so this is, let's, I'll use, I'll use myself as an example, as we go through these, as we go through these steps, but let's talk about a failed launch. Like I had a launch where I put so much into it, my heart and soul and like not one new client. And we've been there. We've all been so, there. If you haven't been there yet, you will be there. <laughs> I just have to put a plug in for my friend, Brenna McGowan, because she has been on the show a couple of times actually, but she talks about the necessity for a pre-launch so that your launch doesn't fail. So I'm going to link that episode ah. in the show notes so that everybody can go. If you have had a failed launch, you need to know Brenna's piece of advice on creating a pre-launch before you launch your 
program or whatever it is, course, whatever it is you're launching. Okay. Sorry to interrupt you. I just had to put that plug in. (laughs) <laughs> Perfect. I need to listen to that episode too. After, say after a failed launch or whatever, bring to mind your situation now, wherever your inner critic is loud. What, getting to know them by that, first of all, giving them a name. Okay. This is my very first inner critic. I named Sharon. And then I had a Deb come around later. You can give it whatever name you want to. The point here being to really separate this part of you. Y'all know what it's like inside your minds. There's a lot of different parts. So just saying, okay, there is me, the me that I, in the good times is whole and complete and and okay. And then there's this part of me that is like railing on me and that that's Sharon that's Frank, whatever it is. And so that just like giving it a name helps to create some separation and something that you can then work with. And then the next part of really getting to know them is really just, it can be scary, but what is it that they're saying? Say it out loud to write it down that you're, you're never going to make it. Like what makes you think that you could have this success or you did this and this wrong like no one wants to buy from you what is this awful voice in your head saying getting it out of your head and onto paper is a shocking can be a shocking experience and it's oh dang like this is brutal and then you can start to understand a little more what this inner critic is is about what it is they're pushing for because often we're really attached to our inner critic because it we feel like it motivates us And in the short term, it often does, but in the long term, it erodes our heart and spirit. (laughs) And in the, there's also, yeah, so really just getting to know them. Like saying first, like, this is a part of me. I'm going to create a space where you're welcome here, inner critic, okay? For a moment, just play with this idea. You're welcome here. You're a part of me. All parts of me are welcome. I want to just get to know what you're about. And then when you feel this inner critic come up again. It might come up in situations where you're not perfect or where you don't feel good in your clothes or whatever it is. You can say, oh, I recognize you, Sharon. There you are. So first of all, just like in inviting the inner critic in. That's step one, like getting to know them. Should we pause there? Any questions? No, I'm good. Let's just, I'm thinking of some examples in my head where I have done this and where I've seen, I just literally had an experience with my son yesterday related to this. And I'm like, okay, he'll be listening to this interview this afternoon. (laughs) Yeah. Oh yeah. No, it's just, it's so true. And I think for those of us who struggle with anxiety or depression or have experienced any form of trauma, though that inner voice comes up so strong and so out of the blue. Sometimes it's like, wait a minute, where did that come from? So I love how you say recognize them and welcome them in so that you can get to know a little bit more about them. And it sounds crazy, but it, this literally is another voice inside your head and you have to quiet that voice. And sometimes there's multiple voices. So I love how you said, Oh, there was Sharon. Then there was Deb. But the reality is the more we can confront those voices, like a real person, the more likely we are, I think, to be able to ask them to be quiet. Yeah, that's so helpful. And to your point about these voices being much louder around our past traumas and things like that, that's really the meat of step two, which is to befriend the inner critic. And so let's think about it this way. I'll just tell you guys, in the vast majority of cases, the inner critic is protecting us. So that the inner critic and after my failed launch wanted me to be successful because successful means that I am worth something and I get daddy's love and attention. Honestly, that's what that one came down to for me. Or in so many of us, we get the praise when we do good, we win, when we make the sale, then it's okay. Now I'm good. And so the inner critic is trying to protect in some way our goodness, our worth, our value. The inner critic is misguided. So this inner critic often, like there's two primary places that an original wounding will happen, that an inner critic will come to protect. And that is from our childhood or from society, from our experience growing up, or it can happen as we're older and get inundated with the world as we know it, societal standards mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. whatnot. But often when we start working with this, it's the, the childhood wound. So it might be you got praise for when you were perfect or when you did things, <clears throat> when you 
checked off all the boxes and did just what your parents told you to or when you were even in the eyes of God. This is such a common place, especially in people that were raised in, in Christian households and in relationship with God, because that's such a powerful position, source mm -hmm. in your life. And there can be a lot of fear that builds up around that. Mm -hmm. like how can I be good enough for God? Mm -hmm. And so at some point in our lives, either as little kids or when we're older in life, there is a wounded part of us. It's like, oh, I'm not good enough for my parents, for my teachers, for my partner, for God, unless I do this. And that is a really painful place to experience. And it's also, we all know it's not true on, up here on one level. We know it's not true. We are good enough for all. And we, there is nothing wrong with us. There's nothing we could do that can make us a less valuable, less worthy of love human being. Really tying that, connecting those two is like the biggest aspect of this healing work. You know, what is the inner critic? What, what wounded aspect of ourselves is it trying to protect? Like you can never not be successful. You were good when you were winning, when you were thin, when you were the life of the party, whatever it is. And so your inner critic is trying to keep you in that because that is what equals worth to your inner critic. So really like befriending the child or the wounded aspect of yourself underneath the inner critic. Okay. What do you think about that one? Oh, that's deep. But I want to just say, so I just happened to read last night and I want to say it was Hebrews where Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And we often forget that's a fact and that we may have to do things to get the love of our parents, but we don't have to do things to get the love of God. And we can accept ourselves knowing that we have that acceptance. We don't have to be perfect. We don't have to do things to receive that love and that grace. So I just wanted to add that in there because I think a lot of people struggle for that with that. And I think as you're listening to your inner critic, if you need a place to go that you feel safe, if you have faith, if you are a Christian or if you're Jewish or whatever faith that you have, that, that sense of faith that God is there, or there's a higher being that's there to love you and nurture you no matter what the earthly people around you are saying. I think that's really important because we do so often get sucked into that. They only like me if I do this. And when you were talking about the self-marriage concept, before we started recording, we were talking and I associated it with that self the, or the, uh, the hookup culture that we're seeing so often with younger people. And it breaks my heart because what, in my opinion, at least that what is happening is these people are searching for something to make themselves feel better. And they're having these relationships when they first meet someone thinking, oh, this person's going to be my, in air quotes, savior and give me all of these things that I need. And so if your inner critic is telling you that you have to do all these things, let's figure out how we can befriend that inner critic and then develop that relationship, like you said, with the inner critic to go back and find out, okay, where is this coming from? And nope, I don't have to do anything to have someone else love me. And if you need that place to start, think of your faith, think of God, and then think of, okay, now I know I have that unconditional love. So now I can start looking at myself and move myself through this experience with this inner critic. Okay. Keep going. Step three. Yeah, that was a really good addition. Thank you. So then step three is to, is to release the inner critic. And so this is, I added this in there because once you, it's a process, we go through these four steps over and over. Often what happens is it feels really good to recognize and give love and respect to that part of you that is wounded, that the inner critic is trying to protect. But the thing is, we've been thinking this way our whole lives. So it's not just, oh, I see the, I see that this inner critic is wrong and really what I need to just do is love myself. And okay, now I don't have to deal with my inner critic anymore. It just comes back and again. So we need to develop then a practice of why well, then step one, like recognizing and say, okay, I see you, Sharon, I hear you, and but I know you're hurting and you don't really mean those things that you say, you're wrong. I love you and you're wrong. We can go now. Like I got this, I have a deeper understanding. I know that I am loved. I know that I don't have to do to be any more loved by God or by whatever. And so in that, 
Okay, I say releasing too, because think about, this might be your experience. I know I've caught myself in this. If I have something that, that quote, fails or what whatever I would like would trigger my inner critic after I did this work I would be like okay that's well that's not true and just brush it off and go on to the next thing or just try to bathe myself in positivity and move on but that is not acknowledging this wounded part of me that's still coming up even though I mm-hmm. want to like brush away the inner critic in doing that and brushing away this part of me that is also painful and still needs my love and affection when these moments occur when you hear your inner critic i would encourage you not to just be like i'm done with you sharon like i'm moving on to the next thing but to every time be like okay i see you i acknowledge you i love you i release you i got this now and i so i think that's a really important part of the process and to just like the workshop that you guys are going to have access to is called silence your inner critic and it's almost like a misnomer because you don't really ever silence it it's a part of you that you learn to have a peaceful relationship with and a one of depth and that will continue for your whole life because yeah, as we said, a hundred percent of successful, beautiful people have an inner critic still. Absolutely. And that is innate when we think of our brain. And I think it's probably the, like in the limbic brain, the amygdala or, and probably other places as well, where, you know, our brains from our ancestors were trained to function a certain way. And there's data to show that like in, in mice, if something happened to the mother mouse, when she was pregnant, her babies then react to that same situation. So no matter, no matter where you are in your life or how successful you become, you're always going to have that because genetically that's how our brain is. And negativity bias too is part of that, where our brain is two thirds more likely to believe something negative than something positive. It's going to look for negative two thirds more, more times than it's going to look for something positive. And don't expect that you're ever going to completely be free of this because I'm a perfect example. I have done so much work on my brain and I still have those voices come up and it's just part of life. So The key here that I want to emphasize from what you said is that to recognize that this is not a one and done, it's just like navigating anxiety. This is daily work sometimes, but it's work for the future. It's not doing it today and then done. Okay. So we are now what? Number four. We're on step number four. Yes. Step number four, which is to replace it, which is my favorite step. So the basic idea is we replace this inner critic, but it's nature abhors a vacuum, right? If you don't have the inner critic, it's then what am I supposed to do now? Or like often when people I go through this work, they're, they experience like this void. And this is the perfect time to implement a self-kindness practice. I wanted to, to just introduce, to share with your audience this a tool, a simple practice that we can all do to really help train our bodies to be kind as a habit. So ultimately, I said the inner critic is the primary obstacle to being kind to yourself. So at once, while we're like, we've identified the problem now, right? So we have these tools now to identify the inner critic, know what it's about, love on it and release it. And at the same time, we want to build an environment in your inner world that is that where the inner critic cannot thrive. And that is an environment of self-kindness. So I just wanted to share with your listeners this super simple tool that has is absolutely like I've done, I'm a doctor and I've done so much training and I've learned so many like fancy, complicated ways of feeling better. But this is just like the simplest thing and it's had the most profound impact on me and my clients. So I'm gonna share with y'all now. So the practice is called Undercover Kindness. And it is, it's called Undercover because no one can tell that you're doing it and kindness because it's this is the way that you train yourself to be self-kind as a default. You train your internal environment to be one of self-kindness instead of criticism. So self Undercover Kindness has three parts. We can all do it right now. The parts are breath, body, and words, right? This is an imaginative exercise. So the first one is breath. Okay, let me preface it with this too. You guys want to do this. Think about when you're doing this. You want to do this activity during a mundane moment. 
in your daily life, something you do every day. My favorite one to recommend is while washing your hands. We all wash our hands, hopefully lots of times. And it's, a, it's just, it only takes a minute. And it's a time when you can usually be by yourself and often there's a mirror, which helps. Uh, but you can do it when you're chopping vegetables, when you're folding laundry, when you're cleaning up something, when you're driving, just whatever. Something that is normal, that is totally neutral and not a stressful experience for you. It's an opportunity for you to practice this undercover kindness multiple times a day. So let's picture, let's all just picture like hand washing while we're doing this. So the first step is breath. So really just being aware of your, of your breath. First, just aware that, hello, you're a human that's breathing. And you might deepen your breath. And really the practice here is to not just focus on your breath, but to imagine that your breath is saturated in kindness. Every drop of your breath is as a drop of kindness and that you can send it to your achy knees or your tense shoulders or your hurting heart. And so just breathing kindness in your body. And that step alone we know can help to get your nervous system into the parasympathetic state, which is a state of healing in itself. So huge part, just kind breath. The next part is to, is to hold your body in a loving way, kind body. What are just checking in with your body in that moment? Okay. So we're washing hands and we're breathing kindness. Maybe we're breathing it into our fingertips or something. And, and then check in with your body. What's tense? What can you relax? Maybe you have, you can soften your shoulders. Maybe you can like let your belly be loose, stretch out a little bit. Just be loving to your body in that moment and, and while breathing kindness. And then the third and final piece is words, a kind inner dialogue. And this is of course the hardest part. And it's, I'm just going to tell you guys, it's 100% awkward 100% of the time for 100% of people that start this practice. And you just charge through and you'll get through it. But I like to tell people to, like, this is it. You just have to practice being nice to yourself, okay? I like to tell people to start with kind of cheerleader vibes, like pep talk in your mind. This is, you, you're doing a great job today. You do, congratulations on just making it through that really stressful interaction and not screaming or whatever. Or like, I'm really, I really love the way that you showed up for this. And I really love this about you. You're doing great. You're doing a great job. You got this. Keep going. That's level one. And then level two is I love you. Just really telling yourself, I love you. I love you, Robin. I love you, Aaron. And this is why hand washing is so great because you can look at yourself in the mirror and say it. And it you probably won't believe it at first or it'll feel contrived and it will be at first because you're in this practice. But over time, it becomes more comfortable. It becomes more natural and eventually it hits in a way that you believe it. And it just takes practice like anything else. This one way I really love to look at this work of self-love was maybe not so woo, it's just habit. We're like habit training. We're spotting like where our negative habits of thinking and feeling, like where those are in our lives and we're changing them to positive habits. And so it just takes repetition and getting through the awkward first phase. So these three things, kind breath, kind body, and then a kind internal dialogue, doing all these three things at once, just in little micro moments of your day, they, it like trains you, it's building the habit of being kind. So you want to do it during these neutral moments so that when you need it later, it's oh, okay, I remember how to be kind to myself. This, this little thing is just, I used to have a job where I was I had a lot of like mindless activities to do and I just did this all day long and it changed my life. It changed who I was, changed how I treated myself. And so I just I'm always excited to share that with people. So as we close out this episode though, what I want to do is just reemphasize that when you transform your life by accepting yourself, quieting that inner critic and loving yourself, you're more able to have strong relationships with other people, treat other people better. You're less irritable. You're less reactionary. And especially I know a lot of you are moms. And if you 
are in a place where your anxiety levels are high all the time and you aren't loving yourself and you're listening to that inner critic and criticizing yourself about being not a great mom or because you blew up with your child or whatever that is, this work is going to help you level out your reactions to all those other things in your world, in your life. So I, I think this is so valuable and I don't think, I don't believe actually that this is woo. I think that this is sound advice to do this work, to quiet your inner critic, to show yourself love, and then accept the love from others on top of that. And I think the more you love yourself, the more you're going to be able to accept God's love, the love of others, because you feel worthy of it. And the bottom line is you are worthy. Every single person listening to this episode is worthy of love and you're worthy of loving yourself. And it starts there so that you can accept it from other people. So Aaron, before we go, tell the listeners how they can connect with you, learn more from you, where they can follow you. And then I will put the link to your course in the show notes. Okay, cool. Yeah. The link to the course, we're going to give you a coupon code so you can take it for free. The silence your inner critic workshop with the coupon code Robin. And I'm, I'm in all the places. I think let's come find me on, on Instagram. If you want to talk more about this work and this course, I tend to share more there, but on Instagram, I'm the self love doctor, self dot love dot doctor. And I'll see you guys over there. Thank you so much. You really just like that last bit you said, you just put a big fat bow on it. That's it in a nutshell. Like you, once you really love yourself, you're training yourself to know that you are worth worthy of love from others. Mm -hmm. And it's a really exciting idea to me, but you guys can all know that a little more. Yeah. It's awesome. So great. So great. So everyone check out the show notes. I will put all the links there so you can access Erin. You can access her masterclass. And I want to add before I go, there will also be a link to another previous episode with Emily Golden, where she talked about the golden rule, where she takes this rule about loving others to loving yourself as well. So I'll link that. So if you are in a place where you have a lot of self-doubt, your inner critic is just on fire and won't cool down, then you have multiple things you can listen to guide you. If you have any questions, don't ever hesitate to reach out. You can always email me at robin at the robin graham.com and hook up with Aaron on Instagram. And I'm sure you're going to learn a ton. If you know anyone who is struggling and could use this information to help them transform their life or become more accepting of themselves and love themselves, or even love you more, <laughs> send this episode their way. I encourage them to listen because I think there's just so much value here. All right. We're going to close out for today and I'll see y'all next week.